All right, real quick introductions. Start with Al Cohn here. He's a veteran in the trucking industry. <clears throat> Graduate of the University of Illinois of Chemical Engineering. Spent 28 years with Goodyear Tire, based in Akron, Ohio, and a variety of assignments related to commercial tires, including compounding design, chief engineer, field engineering, and technical marketing manager. He also spent three years working for Goodyear in Luxembourg, Europe. In, 2000, in 2006, he joined Pressure Systems International, or PSI, out of San Antonio, Texas, as director of uh, new market development and engineering support. PSI is a worldwide leader in automated automatic tire inflation systems for commercial fleets. He's a frequent industry speaker. He's an act, he's active member of SAE, American Trucking Association, Intermodal Association, Association of North America, and Technology and Maintenance Council. I'll receive the Silver Spark Plug Award, which is TMC's highest honor for his contribution to the industry in 2001. He also writes monthly articles on the subject of commercial tires for Fleet Equipment Magazine and PSI Tire Digest. In his spare time, he enjoys taking naps, I hear. Naps. <clears throat> Mark Wilson works for Henderson Tire Commercial Vehicle Systems as a director of Controls Business Unit. He's responsible for the development, production, and marketing of automated automatic tire inflation systems. He has 20 years of experience in heavy duty industry and holds several patents in the field of automatic inflation systems. Before joining Henderson in 2005, Matt worked for Freightliner and Volvo heavy duty truck manufacturers and also J&J &J truck bodies and trailers. His work experience incl includes engineering, new product development and general management. As a father of four youth hockey players, uh, Matt spends most of his free time in the hockey rink, so he don't have time for a whole lot of other stuff. Matt grew up in western Pennsylvania and attended Grove City College, where he earned his bachelor's degree in engineer, electrical engineering. Mark just told me how to pronounce his last name, and I've already screwed it up. Try to figure it out. <laughs> Diefenthaler. Huh? Diefenthaler. Diefenthaler, okay. He's uh, an OEM. Uh, OEM account executive assigned to PACCAR and several large trailer manufacturers since, since 2011 with responsibility for U.S., Canada, and Mexico. Uh, prior to joining Michelin North America in 2003, he held sales and branch manager positions with Extra Lease, where he worked 12 years in Pacific North, West, and Ohio and West Virginia markets. Mark was an ex has extensive fleet and OEM experience on truck and trailer applications, and today he is heavily involved in product marketing, working with the future of tires with the new greenhouse gas regulations. Mark holds a Bachelor's of Science in Business Administration from the University of Laverne, and is a veteran of the U.S. Navy. Thank you for your service, too, by the way. Jeff Weedock. Uh, graduated from Ohio State in 1990 with dual majors, transportation and logistics marketing. Uh, he worked for Fruoff Trailer Corp, uh, working in the ProPart OEM sales division. From 97 to 01, he worked for overnight transportation as regional sales manager. 2001 to currently, he, he started back in the trailer business. AD, AD, AWS was a startup company distributing wheels, tires, and accessories. They have grown from 2001, and they currently have eight distribution centers to service the aftermarket wheel industry and OE trailer industry. Uh, married to Michelle for 26 years, two daughters, Whitney and Sydney, and his hobbies are golf and all sorts of woodworking. Uh, before I get started on, the, the, this is a panel discussion, so we, want, we need all of you involved in this too. It's more of a question and answer thing. We're not going to go through slide after slide and all that, we're just gonna see what you wanna know about tires. And, uh, and we'll let these experts kinda give their opinion on that. But I've got a little story to tell if you don't mind, real quick. You know, over the past you know, 30 years, trailer manufacturers, truck manufacturers have added more and more computers, and they help control all sorts of functions of the vehicle. They have, you know, the computers, they're very positive features to help uh, with efficiencies and safety, but now, Strick trailer uh, come along here and, and we need one more computer added to these electronically controlled vehicles. You know, an engineer I was speaking to up in Fort Wayne 
the other day refers to this mass collection of computers on a typical vehicle as microelectronic networks, or otherwise known as MEN. When asked to explain what the acronym was used for, I was told that they make the vehicle and trailers run harder, faster, and more efficiently, but at times they get distracted and they cause all sorts of problems. To show me what was happening, we took a ride south of here towards Monroe. And at some point, we met a trailer pulling a brand new strict trailer. The next thing you know, the men took over the controls of the vehicle I was in. The airbags inflated all the way, and it made a U-turn and started following this strict trailer. I asked what the heck was happening. Apparently, this phenomenon started about last September when Strix started making trailers great again. <laughs> They've done such a good job at that that the men in these other vehicles started wandering aimlessly following these trailers, keeping a close eye on this incredibly built and attractive backside. <laughs> While all the air in the system is redirected in, into the airbags, making them, yeah. Okay, <laughs> to fix this problem, an engineer developed a mother computer that is designed to control all these men computers in every aspect and every part of the day. The computer will be known as the Waste Less Information for Efficiency, otherwise known as a wife. <laughs> it was given a <coughs> I was given this unique opportunity to test drive this tractor trailer that was occupied by a wife. The first thing I noticed as I performed a pre-trip was that the airbags were excess excessively deflated. <laughs> As I started the vehicle and tried to move it in a fuel-efficient manner, the wife took over and the throttle just went all the way to the floor. And as I approached the stoplight and attempted to slow down in a safe and efficient manner, the brakes, would not, uh, the brakes would not apply right away. I then realized that the wife once again took over and then slammed on the brakes about 100 feet from the light. So as we approached one of these new finely built strict trailers, the steering wheel began to shake vigorously as the men attempted to look while the wife attempted to keep the men focused on the road ahead. So that's my story of Fort Wayne. Uh, we'll jump right into some uh, question and answers. We'll just leave it up to the audience here and if, if uh, we can't get uh, questions, we'll bring some up uh, from what we have in our system here. Does anybody want to start? I know Char Charlie loves to ask. What's that? Why don't I get started with a couple? All right, so uh, how can I maximize mileage out of my trailer tires? Anybody want to answer that, panelists here? I can start. That's sure, fine. Okay. Al. Well, you know, one of the most important things is uh, keep them properly inflated. Uh, you know, air requ uh, tires require air, to, and uh, it's always important to understand that the, the air, recommended air pressure is based on your worst case load scenario. So if you know the load uh, per axle per tire, we can tell you exactly what air pressure you should be running. It might be 100, it might be 120, it might be 85. It all depends on the load. And then, of course, uh, you know, you want to keep the tire inflated because, you know, trailer tires especially are the worst performing tires uh, on the vehicle when it comes to, you know, the total tractor trailer. Uh, they're just not looked at very uh, frequently. Uh, all the industry surveys over the years uh, show that the infla uh, inflation pressure of trailer tires are a big problem, especially the inside duals. And the, uh, always the worst tire, the lowest air pressure tire, is the right rear inside trailer tire. That one is like, no one ever gets to that one. <laughs> so that's a problem. But again, uh, keeping the air, inspecting tires and keeping the air and the, the right air uh, running all the time is the best solution. Matt, do you have more to add to that? I know you built these slides here when it talks about the most important feature. Sure, if you want to, you can you flip through, through those if you'd like. But as, as Al mentioned, realistically, um, the air is the most important thing that you need to do to maintain the tire. So, you, you know, it's, it's good that you select the correct compounding, the right, the right tread for your application and those kind of things. But th the reality is the number one thing you can do to make sure that your tires perform properly is keep them inflated to the proper pressure. And, you, you know, whether, whether you've got an automatic tire inflation system or you have a manual program or how, however you're maintaining your tire pressures, it's, ex it's extremely important to understand 
what your overall fleet pressures look like. So I, I encourage everybody, even if you have an automatic inflation system, you can't ignore it. The, the systems require periodic maintenance, need to do some fleet audits. I, I think that's part of the problem that we run into in, in the industry is you put this system on and then you forget about your tires because, well, they're, they're taken care of. But, you know, periodic auditing of your, of your tire pressures is an important part of, of any maintenance program, even if you have an automatic inflation system on there. I got, a, um, I got a text last night from some of our field engineers. And it's, it's funny that, that Al and you guys are here today with us um, talking about tires, but they saw the, uh, the inline check valve for the first time, one of the guys, on an ATIS system on a trailer. And they go, what's this? So the inline check valve, as you mentioned, it's really what it is for technicians. It's a visual reference is why is that there? Because you think about the systems today, a lot of them, you know, just have the airline go come out of the, the end of the, the, the axle and go right through the valve stem. There's no indication there that they have to do anything with it. It simply is just, it's, it should be perfect because the air pressure is coming out of the axle, filling the tire, it's properly inflated, we're good to go. As you mentioned, if you do your audits, you're going to find out that if you, if you audit 10% of your fleet and you do it at a random point in time, you'll find out that you're going to have air pressures that are imbalanced. Inside dual, outside dual, you're going to find low tires. You're going to find these things. I did this about five months ago myself. Al knows about this. We found a lot of wild things, didn't we? Um, it's pretty amazing what you can find out. So technician-wise, do not walk past your tires with ATIS. Do, do periodic checks. Do scheduled maintenance, you know, on your tires to keep them properly inflated. The other thing I will say is a, a good operating tire starts at the mounting process. So please mount your tires properly. If you walk into a shop and you see a technician with the tire leaned up against a truck or a, a the cage like this and they're trying to inflate the tire, guess what? 65-pound wheel cannot be lifted up into the proper, proper seating area of the, of the tire by air pressure. You're going to have a run-out issue. So the place that tires wear out is when it leaves the road surface. So if you think about what's going on with the tire as it leaves the road surface, that's where it slips. So where it slips is telling you what's going on. Is it properly mounted? Is it properly lubed? Is it properly aligned in the wheel and tire together? Those kind of things. Is the wheel bent? Look for run out laterally and radially. So those kind of things will help too. Uh, just, just to clarify what uh, Mark said real quickly, uh, at, at PSI we offer now this uh, uh, hose with an extra check port so you can quickly check the air pressure if you wanted to. And I think that's what Mark was, was. Uh, was uh, trying to highlight here, that uh, rather than unscrewing the hose to check the tire pressure by using this extra check port, that kind of lets the uh, folks know that, hey, it's, it's, you can still check a tire pressure. Because uh, sometimes what happens is if the sun's beating down on one side of the, the trailer versus the other side, you could have, you know, five, six, seven, eight pounds, you know, m more pressure. So uh, this way, especially at a PM, it's easy to get all the tires back at the right pressure again, and then you're good for, you know, the next PM. Question? Well, uh, th that's uh, yeah. Well, the the question was a, a, a well long question, but the bottom line <laughs> was that does your system adapt to the temperature and pressures and and dynamically and all the different changes? The answer is no, it does not because it, that would allow it's a very complex. Like for example, the ultimate system is like a central tire inflation system, which the military uses where the loads, uh, and in, based on the load and the speed, the inflation pressure changes. Well, you know, those systems cost, you know, $35,000, $50,000. That's very doable, but it's, there's a lot of cost involved. For the trucking industry, essentially automatic tire inflation systems simply add air to a tire when it's low. That's the, that's the big issue, okay? Because underinflation is always the problem. So what happens is, 
as being an old tire designer, even the tires are designed to take into account there's going to be a very big swing in air pressures. When it's cold, it's going to be on the lower side. When it's hot, it's going to be on the higher side. If the sun's beaten down, you can get 7, 8 PSI higher. But the tires are designed to take all that into account. Now, some tire makes and models may be a little more sensitive than other tires, but overall, it's not going to have a huge impact on your tire performance. And again, the key is just not to be running underinflated, where all of a sudden now that adversely affects fuel economy, retreadability, tire mileages. Uh, excuse me. Yes, um, one of the things that I he touched upon a lot of the good uh, topics, but uh, you know when you're mounting a tire, you need to properly lube it. He mentioned that um, you, you should match mount a tire with the high spot and low spot. Um, another thing is called uniformity um, with the lateral run out of the tire and the wheel combination. Um, but match mounting is the easiest thing you can do before you balance a tire. Um, you can put the high spot on the rubber to low spot on the wheel, which is typically marked by a yellow dot on the sidewall of the tire. Um, a wheel, aluminum wheels, the valve stem is the low spot. That's what you index it with. Um, some of the steel wheels have dimple marks, but if it's not there, then it's typically this, the valve stem that you need to use as the match mounting point. But all those things go together to give you the, the smoothest, most dynamically rolling, free rolling, uh, tire and wheel assembly. Um, like he said, if you're, if you're leaning one up against the side of a, a building and it's not going to seat up properly, um, that's probably, in addition to air pressure issues, one of the biggest problems we have in the tire business is getting something that's not properly mounted uh, so the tire bees don't seat and you get vibrations and consequently you have some issues. Yeah, from a longevity standpoint, anybody else that wants to answer this. When I did a study on our fleet tire failures here a couple of years ago, it was a small amount, but we did have some amount of premature failures due to damage to the bead. And whether it come from mount, either, you know, either from the mounting or from a Impact. worn out wheel, what should fleets be looking at? What should we be looking at in terms of wheels other than just inspecting them for burrs or, or uh, you know, anything else? Check your tools. <coughs> Tool damage. Um, the guy's getting too aggressive when they're demounting and mounting tires, not using enough lube. A properly lube, you know, when you lube a, a tire and wheel for assembly, um, you want to lube the tire and the wheel, yep. and you want to you want to lube down in the wheel itself, drop so center. the drop flange, right? So down in the center of it, because when you push a tire, if you lube the the both beads and you push that tire across a dry wheel, guess what? It's going to collect that lube as it travels to the next, next rim flange, and you're going you're to remove the lubrication to the other side. So what you want to do is you want to lube both beads of both tires, of the tire, both sides. You want to lube the rim flange of the rim, and if you can, just get a quick dash in the center. As it passes through, it's going to maintain that lubrication for both sides. That way, when you inflate it, it's going to have a great chance of, of seating up evenly all the way around. Um, and your tire should seat at about 40 pounds of pressure if it's <coughs> lubed properly. Oh, I think you can do less than that. Yeah. So as a shop manager walking through the shop and these, you know, especially if we don't have really good policies on the type of lube, what is the stuff I should be throwing in the trash if I find it? People that are using to lube their tires, but I'm, I'm sure you're not going to use Dawn dish soap, right? I mean, probably years ago you did, but there's certain kind of lubricants that is recommended, or maybe lubricants that have certain compounds in them, is that correct? Uh, certain properties, yes. You want a non-oil-based. Non-oil-based. Uh, Vegetable-based product. That's the most important thing, but are, is there others that can cause damage to the tire and uh, I think some can can cause some uh, some rusting and some uh, some problems between the bead and the wheel over time, um, but they can also deteriorate the rubber if it's the wrong kind of material. You don't want any solvent base. It's yeah. it's not like your Mark said. Uh, you know, vegetable oil base is what you want. Okay. And if you see a guy with a big hammer swinging on a tire trying to break it down, throw that hammer away. Okay. <laughs> 
because in that sidewall is cables, right? Yeah. And when you damage those cables, and you might you might get it to reinflate, and it might operate for a while, but you've bruised that tire. It's a weak spot of the tire. So when you see guys swinging at tires to try and break them down, throw that big hammer away. That's the wrong way to do it. So from a, I think we talked kind of, you know, efficiency and longevity. So, you know, when we talk about inflation, I know it if the footprint, explain the footprint. Okay, can one of you guys explain the, kind of what the, you know, when we're talking about the footprint on the road and how that inflation affects that? I'll take that one. Go ahead. You know, I, that that's really what the proper air pressure does for you is it gives you a correct footprint. And, and as Mark had mentioned earlier, you know, what, what really causes tire wear is, is where, when and where the tire leaves the surface of the road. So particularly with trailers in a trail position, that's the worst, um, the worst position on a, on a tractor trailer for, for uh, irregular wear because since you're not driving any torque through the tire, that in this free rolling position, once it starts to wear badly, then those cupped areas or any area that doesn't make good contact with the surface of the road, then uh, continues to wear more, the cup gets bigger, wears more, it's, it's self-fulfilling at that point, and you really can't square up or scrub off a, a trailer tire like you might do with a drive position. So, and if you look at this slide, you can see, you know, just a across the board, whether you have duals or you have wide base single tires, you have, you know, slightly different tire footprints, but, but the bottom line is you want to make sure that the pressure in the tire matches the expected load because that gives you the most consistent footprint It's going to give you the most consistent wear. A good example, just to follow up on Matt's comments there, if you had a 295-75R225 uh, low profile trailer tire and it's you know, set at 100 PSI, your footprint is you know, so long. Uh, and then if you were running underinflated, let's say the inside dual was 70 PSI, there's actually 18% more rubber on the road. The footprint is much longer. So when the rubber is longer uh, and it's also generating more heat when you run underinflated because the sidewalls are deflecting more, so in combination with the longer footprint, the extra heat, uh, you also uh, you know, get all this irregular wear and you tend to pick up more puncturing objects as well because there's more rubber on the road and the rubber is hotter and softer. So all bad things happen when you run underinflated and the footprints clearly show that. We have any questions? Yeah. Everybody I'll hear that question? <coughs> I'll take that one. <laughs> okay, so in, uh, at the ATA, <coughs> I think it was the ATA or, <coughs> excuse me, back in 2001 is when Michelin first introduced the wide base single tire. And the whole point of that tire was, was doing three things really. It was one, it was, it was fuel savings, so drive and trailer. Um, weight savings was a big one and also less, less maintenance, if you will, because you have two side walls versus four on each wheel position and brakes run cooler, et cetera, et cetera. Today, when you fast forward today where we are today, um, I estimate today about 10,000 trailers a year are being bought new with wide base tires. So it, that number hasn't grown or shrunk in the last five years. It's been pretty consistent. With the advancement in dual tires um, versus wide base tires, back when tires first came out, uh, a premium dual tire today, say for one of our product lines, for example, um, combined with the right truck tires pulling the trailer, you can get as good a fuel economy today on duals as you can on wide base tires. You can't, the, the gap now is, is so tight that you can't measure it. So really the advantage today for wide base tires is purely weight savings. So if you can benefit from weight savings in a truck trailer combination, and you can carry an additional 700, 800 pounds of load versus, say, a steel or a dual tire combination. If that allows you to get a shipper or secure business or pick up more loads because you can carry more payload, that is the benefit today. But we're, we're seeing a lot of fleets that have adopted wide base are staying on wide base. Um, the downside to wide base, in my opinion, for a trailer is become resale. Is those fleets that buy it new buy it for a reason and it helps their business and they, 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 can, they can see the value in the bottom line. The hard part on this is on the back side. 
Sometimes they have to convert them to duels to resell them. Um, depending on the axle, hopefully they can resell them with duels. If not, they sell them with single wide tires on and they might take a financial hit of a few thousand dollars a trailer to move them out of their fleet. So, but today I think the biggest benefit is, is, is for weight, uh, for trailer is weight and number two is maybe revenue if they can carry more load. But the fuel efficiency has been narrowed quite a bit. Spread axle in dual or wide base is always going to put more lateral stress on the tire. Um, but in a wide base tire, now you're dragging 17 inches of tire across the road surface, if you will, laterally versus duals. I think, I think the scrub is a little bit more, is a little bit more, I think it's harder on the wide base than it is on, on duals, in my opinion. I think the wear rate and the, the regular wear might be more pronounced than it would be on a dual tire. But a little more sensitive, I think. I mean, my experience is that the wide base is a little more sensitive to the on, uh, for on spreads when it comes to scrubbing than the duals. But any tire, wide base or or duals, is is needs to be you know um, a wider turn on a spread is better than a narrow turn on a spread. So one of the complaints I get, <coughs> I just had this complaint last week from a driver that basically basically said he's losing traction the tires are unsafe you know you name it I'm not talking about wide base or or uh, or duels necessarily I hear it from you know all applications but you you get your tread depth gauge out and you go out and you have nine and ten maybe even eight thirty seconds you know DOT says basically down to two thirty seconds so uh, I guess I'm just, what are some of the comebacks, we, you know, as managers that we can give these guys to make them understand, look, these things aren't really any more unsafe. If you can have a brand new tire and go through two inches of water fast and you're going to lose control. Any comments or? So he was complaining about traction, Randy? Is that what traction, you're saying? Traction, yeah. In what kind of surface? Uh, typically wet. I mean, you hear it. I mean, how many fleet managers do we have in here, people that have drivers? And how many, how many of you have had the conversation probably in at least the last week over my tire tread is too low, I need the tires replaced? Which a lot of times if they just go to their techs, it was up to the techs, they just replace the tires. But you say, no, we don't replace them until they get to a certain point. Well, I'll just make a general comment. <clears throat> if you look at tire design in general over the last eight years, drive tire specifically. Everybody's been chasing fuel efficiency due to the, you know, um, greenhouse gas regulations or whatever. Tires today have a lot less voids than they did 10, 12 years ago. In other words, you saw a lot more lug tires you did, you know, 10, 12 years ago, which gave you high mileage. There wasn't a big consideration for fuel. But today, to get a tire more fuel efficient, we're making them shallower and we're, we're, they have less voids. So with less voids, you may have a situation where you have less evacuation for traction and those kind of things. So um, what some tire manufacturers are doing is we're actually uh, creating regenerating grooves. So as you think of a, of a block of rubber, as it wears down, at about half-life, there's two blocks underneath. So it regenerates. So we're trying to do those sort of things now to, to extend sort of the wear life and to give more traction at half-life versus just having that go away. So there's, it's part of the greenhouse gas, it's part of chasing fuel economy, is to put more mass on the tire, you know, to create uh, tires more efficient. And in doing so, you might give up some of those other features. But we are building tires and lugs that are different to have sort of biting edges. So the block isn't just a block of rubber anymore, now it's got sipes in it. It's got sipes in it, so as that sipe rolls through the road, Ideally, it creates a biting edge and opens up a little bit to give some traction. So um, that's just the nature of the business. I mean, we've got more tires coming out now that are taking away some of the, I guess you can see, visual traction features. But that's part of the business we're in with this, these new regulations and laws we're all faced with. Yes, Charlie. Charlie. Right. What do you guys 
I'm not hearing that. <laughs> and I, I'll, I'll tell you why, because I've been on a half a dozen, maybe you guys have two, SAE fuel tests. I'm sure you've been on them. Um, where you've got portable fuel tanks. You've got, I've been on one fuel test. I mean, we had two tractors. They were one bin number off. We had two drivers. They were twin brothers. I mean, we had the same trailers with the same load on the same roads. <coughs> and we took non-fuel tires and fuel tires. We ran them for four days. And when we do, we do modeling, we can all do modeling. You can go on websites today and you can do modeling on tires that are fuel efficient, not fuel efficient. And, and be, before you do a very expensive SAE fuel test, you want to determine, first of all, if you're going to win. You know, you don't want to go out there and spend 100 grand and test fuel tires if you're not going to win, if you're not going to show some value. So with this one fleet, we had the trucks, the number apart, we had twin brothers, we had the same identical equipment. We had the, 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 the chief guy there from the service maintenance department. We had the finance guy there with us and somebody else for four days. We clearly measured fuel savings with fuel tires. The difficult part that fleets have in measuring fuel savings is they don't take the time to do what we did. What people do with SAE fuel tests is because it's expensive to do. So it's hard to determine sometimes if you're getting the fuel economy out of your equipment because you have varying loads, you have varying drivers, you have wind, speed, direction. You got different acceleration patterns from different drivers. So it's very difficult to do. But I will tell you that if you go to these, these websites, like we have one for ourselves where you go and you can do the quick analysis by just changing tires on your vehicle, steer, drive, or trailer. You do those things. From my personal experience is the outcome um, from that test, that, that very simple 10, 15 minute evaluation analysis is it's very, very close to real life SAE fuel test outcomes. And that's from my five, five experiences doing it in Arkansas and Utah and different parts of the country. So that's a, it's, it's a common question we get. People say, I'm not sure I'm getting the benefit out of my fuel tires because I can't measure the fuel. And that's when we'll sometimes step up and say, okay, let's go, just go test them. And every outcome I've been on, they have not changed. They've all stuck with their fuel tires. They have not gone back to a mileage tire because the benefit was truly financial, was there, was measurable. Oh, God. Well, these were big fleets. It was in the millions of dollars savings. Anything, I'll tell you, for a, a good question. A rule of thumb, if you go to, uh, and I'll just use our company because I know our user website works, is there's a fuel economy calculator on there. If you go in there and you choose, a, choose one truck and one trailer, you put in your steer tires, tra drive tires, trailer tires. You put in your average miles per year, you put in your, your cost of fuel. Anything under 2% as an outcome, you can't measure. It's very difficult to measure on an SAE fuel test. Anything more than 2%, you're typically going to see some, some savings in fuel. And, and uh, the, the tire wear on a fuel tire versus non-fuel tire, your wear rate per, per 30 second is very similar. But what, what you give up on a fuel tire is tread depth. So, um, but fuel, um, fuel pays for tires. It, right back it, here. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, I can tell you for, for, for dry van and reefer production, I would say today 80% is probably on, on fuel tires. Smart, smart way or better. And smart way is 5.1 kg per ton mile. There's tires that are better than that. I would say the market is there already on, on, on dry van and reefer for the most part. On truck, I would say we're about 50% there. And on the, on the fuel versus non-fuel tires on truck, for example, um, some of the fuel tires are getting as good a wear rate, both in wear per 30 second and total mileage as, as, as mileage tire was or is. So they've come quite a long ways. And, and Smartway, that's a, when you mentioned Mark, I mentioned Smartway. You know, Smartway publishes a, on their website a list of the, what they call verified technology for low rolling resistance tires. So there's about 300 new tires and retreads on that list for all the different wheel positions, steer, drive, and trail, that meets a certain criteria, which has to be like at least 3% better in fuel economy uh, versus a control tire. 
And the other point being is just because you have a tire is on that uh, smart way verified technology list, that doesn't mean they're all the same, I think, to, to Jim's question there, because just you, to make the list, you're meeting a minimum threshold, but um, you have to really test at your own uh, operation to determine, you know, is tire A uh, better than B or C uh, for fuel economy for my fleet? To be on that list by category, you have to be at a certain threshold or below, mm -hmm. as measured by uh, the standard. So for trailer, it's 5.1 kg per ton mile. They use that figure. That's also referred to as coefficient of roller resistance. So if you're, if you're there below and it's near in the category for trailer, then it's considered smart weight. But there are tires that we sell today that are better than that number. Okay. Did you have a question over here yet? No? Okay, back here. So the question was, this is an ongoing discussion, um, the greenhouse gas too with tires. Um, how many are aware of the regulation or have even followed any part of it in the room? Have you, a number of you have followed it? <clears throat> so this is a difficult one for me to comment on because I don't have access to the greenhouse gas model that Troy might with your manufacturing business. But there are certain tires that you might buy today and fleets that might buy today that they cannot buy in 2018. It depends on the equipment, how it's spec'd, and how it's being used. For example, flat flatbed will probably have the biggest single impact um, over a dry van or reefer just because of the regulation. For example, um, tire inflation systems are going to be mandated on flatbed in 2018, which today it's not. Um, flatbed, you have to be 6.0 kg per ton mile or below on tires uh, for a tight tandem. Um, if you're a spread, then you're exempt. Um, so today for us, we've got three tires that qualify for flatbed. We have a wide base and we have two, two dual tire products. That's it. Um, we do sell another one today on flatbed that cannot be purchased unless it's being used in a, in a, in a, in a 10 spread or 10-2 spread combination, which makes it exempt. So on dry van, there's still very good com there's still very good options for, for dry van and reefer in 2018 for tires. The, the GHD phase two has got really kind of, kind of three entry phases, 2018, well 2018, 2021, 2024, and 2027. Um, each one of those, those three year periods has different targets for tires for fuel efficiency. On, on dry van and reefer, I know, I know we're, we're ready at 2027 regulation today, so we're ready there um, for that product line. I think a lot of our competitors are probably pretty close to that as well. Um, but it will change how you order equipment. I mean, it's going to change a little bit. But it's going to be a gradual change. It's not going to be an immediate change. I'm not sure I answered your question, but there's still some moving parts to that. And I will tell you this, at TTMA, uh, Charlie probably is aware of this, Strick is aware that they have filed a lawsuit against the EPA to have the regulation thrown out. And right now we're probably about halfway into the 90-day stay where they're, you know, waiting to get some comment back on that. And it's really great reading. There's only 7,700 pages to go yeah. through the regulations, so it's fascinating reading. Uh, Al, what else do you have? <laughs> you have page one. You haven't got past that one yet, have you? No, John. What else do you have in terms of uh, the greenhouse gas? Yeah. I mean, Anything I to add that he, that um, he No, cover? I think we, we covered it pretty much. I mean, the, the key is that uh, there's, there's some exempt trailers uh, in there that are, uh, if, if there's four or more axles, and, or if the trailers are less than 35 feet, uh, then they're excluded from the rulemaking. But uh, everything else is in there. And then there's box and non-box. So uh, the, the box uh, versus non-box, I mean, everyone pretty much has to use low rolling resistance tires. Uh, in combination with either tire pressure monitoring systems or automatic tire inflation systems, uh, if they're if they're non-box, that like the flatbeds, the container chassis, and the uh, tankers, because those are considered working trailers. So there's only so many options available. Versus if you have a, a box trailer or reefer trailer, then you you have a op uh, you, they always have a uh, chance to use different technologies. You know, lightweight materials, the trailer skirts, the the, the nose, uh, the, the trailer nose cone, uh, those type of things. Uh, but there's lots of different options. As long as you make your numbers, you're okay. So, 
you have some choices, though. But, but to expand on what Al is, is saying, um, when, when you look at, at the category for box trailers and you, you work through the numbers and you look at the most efficient way for a trailer OEM or a fleet in terms of, you know, upfront purchase costs of the trailers, it's, it's really looking likely that the, the, the easiest solution is either a tire pressure monitoring system and ATIS on all of your box trailers in combination with low rolling resistance tires and skirts. So that, that seems to be the, the simplest way to hit the numbers. But as Al mentioned, there's, there's other things you can look at, um, but, but a lot of those other options may be more costly. So I, I think that's probably where most of the industry is going is, is skirts plus low rolling resistance tires in combination with either ATIS or, or monitoring. Had anything from a suspension system that new and proved it's going to affect, you know, what are the things you guys are doing to kind of help with tires, wheels, uh, maybe alignment stuff? You know, you know, at Hendrickson we do pre-aligned trailers and that, for, for some customers and that can kind of help out. Alignment obviously is really important. Um, but one of the things that we've been struggling with a little bit to try to understand is along with greenhouse gas, you do get credit for weight savings. And, and all of the, the trailer OEMs are trying to, to work their way through and try to understand, you know, what, what does that credit look like and how can I utilize it? You only get to keep a portion of it because if you save weight, you might just put on more load and so you, you wipe out any fuel reduction associated with that. But some of the big questions would be, how do I quantify what that weight savings is? Can I, can I take the heaviest possible trailer spec that I ever, you know, that, that, that I ever produce and compare that to the lightest slider combination, um, take the difference and claim all that as weight savings. That's my old model, this is my new model. Um, it's, it's, not, it's not straightforward as to how you can get the maximum credit out of the weight savings. There's certain approved technologies, aluminum wheels, I think, and, and certain hub combinations. So I, I think that, that, you know, that's where Hendrickson has been, been working a little bit is trying to figure out, you know, how can we take some weight out of our systems? And then if we do and when we do, how does an OEM, you know, how are they able to take advantage of that and apply it to greenhouse gas? Charlie's got a question. What do you see as the future for telematics, uh, this trailer intelligence monitoring system, predictive analytics, in terms of helping with operating costs, specifically tire? I, I think that there's a lot to be gained if you can gather that data. Um, we, we as an industry, I think, are a little bit behind. You look at what Europe has, and one of the previous panelists was talking about all of the interaction between truck and trailer in Europe and, and the information you can pass back and forth video. Like we, we really can't transmit video from a, from a trailer to a tractor because we don't have these high bandwidth solutions. Um, I think that's, that's really what needs to be hammered out in our industry. And if you go to TMC and, and some of these other organizations, there's a lot of talk around how do we communicate better between the tractor and trailer? I mean, I, ideally, you'd have a CAN bus wired connection just like you have in Europe because now that opens up the door to share a lot of this data. Um, right now, it's, it's a little bit convoluted. It's kind of the, the Wild West out there in terms of how people get their information off of trailers, whether you transmit it directly via cellular or satellite services or you somehow <coughs> use PLC or other technologies to get it to the truck. So I, I think that's going to be worked out over the next little bit, but, but you're right, if, if you could get more information and more analytics about not just tires, but you know, predictive maintenance things in terms of braking systems or um, d d lots of different things that can be sensed on the tractor and trailer and, and communicate it back to your dispatch facility and head a driver off and send him to have those repaired prior to having a, you know, a breakdown on the road. And we, yeah, okay. Well, okay. Thanks, thanks, Al. Um, Michelin late last year completed a, um, a beginning engineering project where uh, now all of our truck tires have RFID chips in the tires. So the chip is about a third as big as a credit card and about as thin as a credit card or even a business card. Right now the chip is just writable, so we're, we're writing to it. We're giving each tire a unique uh, serial number, if you will, you know, identifies a tire, uh, where it came from, what plant, what day is built on, what materials are in it, those kind of things. Phase two, phase three, phase four is to make it readable and writable. I'm sorry, today it's readable. We're going to make it writable. So for example, autonomous trucks. Um, being involved in the truck side of the business with OEMs, is this, there's all a lot of discussion now about autonomous trucks and platooning and those kind of things. 
well, if the tire can't, can't communicate to the truck that there's a tire going flat or going something going wrong with it, then that, that tire could be the, the barrier to a truck being autonomous, if you will. So ideally, the, the chip will begin to communicate with the truck one day. It'll tell what's going on with the tire, telling if it's, if it's underinflated, what position it's in, um, air pressure, those kind of things. Um, when it comes to retreadability, you can maybe re-scan re this chip and scan the chip and tell you the age of the, age of the tire, how many miles are on the casing, these kind of things that kind of give you an indication whether or not you want to retread it or just scrap it. So rather than just using a DOT date, you maybe can use uh, revolutions per mile or total miles on a, on a tire or casing for retreadability. So we see some future with technology in the RFID chip, and we're, we're focusing some attention on that as far as... Well, we can also, uh, with our PSI automatic tire inflation system, right now we're using telematics. You know, we have a, like a light that's on front of the trailer, as you're aware, and when air is being added to a low tire, uh, that light will come on, the driver sees it in the side mirror. That tells him the system's working and doing its job, but at some point he needs to let maintenance know that, you know, the, need, the tire needs to get repaired. It probably has a puncture. So what a lot of fleets are doing now is when that, that light coming on is just a 12-volt signal that's being activated. So we can connect to like SkyBits or Qualcomm or, or PeopleNet or any of those uh, uh, telematic technologies that are out there and just have a signal sent that that 12-volt light came on and that can go right to dispatch so they can flag that trailer that that needs to be checked out at some point. So we can do that right now with just uh, basically uh, 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 just a software change and uh, one wiring harness. Other Questions from the audience? Right corner. I'm sorry. Yes. That's a good question. Um, the regulation was signed or finalized late last year, and it's until, until you have a regulation that you have to work from to know what you have to do going forward, it's difficult to know what your next step is as a tire manufacturer. So on the product side is we've been in discussions for quite some time on this topic. We have a lot of tires that, that do well and make, will meet the regulation, allow manufacturers to build equipment, but in cases like yours, um, it takes several years to build a new tire, and it can take two to four years from design to testing to final production. So if a tire doesn't exist today in your application that meets your regulation, that's definitely an area to go back to the EPA and NHTSA and say, look, we're not there yet. You need to give us some relief on this piece of equipment. Or maybe consider work performing equipment, which gives you some relief. I don't know. But there's probably going to be a few barriers to the, to the regulation because some tires just won't get you there. Um, but we're looking at all those applications and trying to adjust accordingly. But it, it takes, if we're not there now, it takes two to four years to get a tire in the pipeline to design it, test it, and get it for sale. So it, so if we haven't got a product there, you got to really just hit every manufacturer up and see which one you can get that'll work. But we all report what's called the CRR number to the OEMs. It's called the coefficient of roll resistance number. And the number today is proprietary, so we, we test it. We spend a bunch of money with Standards Lab and Smithers Lab testing tires every year, as well as our competitors do the same thing. And when we give those values to the OEM, that's what you're going to use to input into your GEM scores, GEM models, to determine if you have a compliant piece of equipment. If you don't, then you've got to really kind of go back to the manufacturer of tires, your supplier, and say, you know, what can you do? How fast can you get us there? So it's a good question. I don't know how soon we can get there. So from a uh, Alan and uh, Matt talking about the auto inflation systems, we, you know, we have this big PM sheet, typically fleets two pages, and uh, I don't know that we've actually added to ours at Batesville, but what should we be adding to the PM sheet in terms of inspecting these systems to make sure that they're working the way, that, other than just gauging the 
the tires. Well, well, we we I, I think uh, we all publish a you know like a one-page, two-page PDF <laughs> that it goes step by step on a typical PM what to be checking for. Uh, you know, for our system, it's you know soapy water essentially. So if you see a bunch of bubbles, you got a leak possibly. Uh, maybe uh, the rotary union has worn out. Time to replace it. Uh, it's really very simple, but you still need to be looking at it uh, you know, during PMs. I, I mean, I always encourage fleets and users to use some common sense in terms of, you know, how often you ex inspect the rest of your pneumatic system. You know, you have airlines and fittings and things all over a trailer and a truck, and, you know, whatever you're doing to check those, uh, you should be checking tire inflation systems at the same time. And, and soapy water, as Al mentioned, is one good way. Obviously, look for visible damage on a regular basis pre-trip, and, and, you know, if you, if you hear any audible leaks, for sure, that, that's something that needs to be addressed. If, if you can hear it, it's a, it's a pretty big leak. One more question. Oh. oh. Yes. Any other questions? Yeah, I see. No, never mind. Anybody else? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no. Troublemaker back there. Well, we're doing that now, what you just mentioned. We're studying that very topic as, as to what's the, you know, what's, because you're never going to get it to the exact pressure, but you're going to get within a range. Like, like these systems all get you within a, within a nice, comfortable range. Um, every tire manufacturer builds tires and designs tires to a standard. So there are load inflation tables. And those load inflation tables are, are pretty consistent. Low profile tire, tall 22, low 24, those kind of things are pretty consistent. So that part's taken care of. I think if you get, if you, if you take your heaviest average load of your operation, let's say one, one way you're loading, you know, cases of beer, and the other way you're loading uh, toilet paper, but you take your average, you know, weight of your load, I think you want to design your, your, first of all, your set pressure to that average highest load. So let's say today, I think today 100 pounds in a lot of cases is overinflated, in my opinion. I think when you set new tire inflation systems like these guys sell, I think 90 PSI out of the factory is a better number than 100. Because I, I, think, I think 100, you always tend to overinflate. You mentioned underinflation. We see a lot of overinflation uh, on some systems. So I think starting at 90 is better than 100. But I like the idea that you mentioned about the, the tire management and load management with air pressure. I think that's a great solution if that can ever be a, 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 you know, designed and, and produced where it's efficient and costly, cost effective. But we are monitoring that. I mean, um, I'm not sure I'm answering your question, but I, I think. Well, well, I think to expand on it a little bit, I, I think those tables already exist. So, so like Mark and the guys on the tire side, you know, the, the load inflation tables will tell you for an expected axle load what is the optimum tire pressure, or minimum tire pressure you want that you can run at. So, um, so I think the information is there. I think that it's it's a matter of when can the technology catch up. And so, you know, on the Hendrickson side, we we've been looking at, at things like that, you know, um, we, we are, we do have a system that is able to um, relieve air out of tires and we could adjust pressure up and down, but, but, you know, and I think that's the future, but there's some things that come along with that and that is, you know, when you put a steel coil on a flatbed, you, know, you, lo you load your trailer like in two seconds. So what happens? So how do I, you know, there's a lot of volume of air inside a tire, so how do you respond quickly um, when you're moving into the loaded condition and, and get the air back in there fast enough so that you don't run your tires underinflated. So there, there's, there's some tech, you know, some technology barriers that need to be overcome, but I certainly think that potentially that is the future that, you know, if you could, if you could adjust your tire pressure based on the load inflation tables, knowing the given axle load at any, at any point in time, that would be uh, the best way to do it. it it's just there's, uh, it's just we're not there yet.